Hi everybody, how are you? Happy Monday to you. Um, this is Tess Crawley, of course, clinical and forensic psychologist and director of Dr. Tess Crawley and Associates. I was just having a chat this morning to one of my colleagues in the practice about what um, I do when I'm asked to do a family assessment for the court. Hi Luke, welcome. Um, I'm just going to share while we're talking, share into the Stigma Rebellion and a couple of my professional groups as well because I think this would be a topic that a few people might actually want to hear about because it's a bit of a mystery really what our role is when we go to court um, and I have certainly been to court a few times now and uh, as you can imagine it can be quite stressful um, it can be quite mystifying because um, sometimes when you're in the courtroom you have no idea what's gone on before and what's going to come after your particular um, bit of evidence so bear with me and I'll just get all these groups happening so that everybody's on the same page I better put it into our friend um, uh, Hobart Perinatal Psychology page as well because there'll be a number of families in that group who might be interested. Hi Amanda, welcome. I don't know if we've been live together before Amanda, nice to have you here. Um, perhaps we have, I'm just not remembering. Okay and we'll pop it into Rural Psychology Tasmania as well and one last group to share with which is Rural, Psycho uh, Rural Mental Health Professionals Australia. Gosh, so many groups now and um, you know I love the fact that I've got these communities now that are separate psychological communities and um, mental health professionals and consumers of mental health um, issues and so on and so on and so on. Lots of fun talking to you all uh, and it's the nice thing is when I talk about different topics, different people, hi Frank, when I talk about different topics it attracts different people because of course the title of the vlog uh, might appeal to some people more than others. So I do have to be quick because I've also got a meeting coming up with another psychologist colleague from another organisation very soon. So I might just move, I wonder if I can see my clock from here, I can, okay. Right, family court. So um, I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist. Now my forensic psychology um, uh, accreditation came through the fact that I completed a PhD in a clinical forensic area so I studied I've talked about this briefly before I studied personality and aggression and violence and personality disordered symptoms in young women I also worked uh, one of my placements as a student was at Risdon prison in Tasmania and then after that uh, once I was a fully registered psychologist my first job was in the prison um, and uh, here in Hobart and I did go and work briefly in a prison in Queensland as well uh, which was very interesting um, there's oh Amanda's telling me there's a training by the APS for, for the forensic psychology group on parenting capacity assessments in April next year that I'm going to and so I'm very interested in this topic well Amanda I might pop along to that too because you never can know too much about this particular topic so my, my interest my forensic psychology work initially started very much based on criminal um, uh, behaviours and, and understanding criminal behaviours and doing criminal assessments um, and then um, I became very interested in perinatal and infant mental health and as you know we have a division of our practice called Hobart Perinatal Psychology uh, which is of course a statewide service that we provide or well, almost statewide um, and through that work I started getting referrals a few years ago for um, uh, child protection assessments. So when child protection is um, is looking at a family that is at risk, one of the things that they will do is they will ask for a psychological assessment and they'll look at the family, they'll look at the children, they'll look at the relationship between the um, parents and the children, so they're looking at attachment there. And they'll also look at the parenting capacity, which is what Amanda was talking about, um, parenting, parenting capacity of the parents. Now sometimes those assessments are 
all around risk issues to do with mental illness, sometimes to do with intellectual functioning, sometimes the risk issues are around violence of course, um, or around substance use. And oftentimes, not always, but um, you know, from time to time I will be making recommendations that um, the children remain in um, out of home care. But sometimes my work is around helping child protection understand what, well in fact all of my assessments are about helping child protection understand what um, factors would need to be in place to support the children being reunified with their parents and I'm always excited when there's a successful reunification with parents um, and that parents you know when they're when they've got a plan laid out in front of them of what they need to do to reduce the risks to their children it's very fulfilling for me to to know that that plan has been followed through and that the children have been successfully reunified so you know it's not about being a big bad guy and and whisking children away from families it's about looking first and foremost at what's in the children's best interest um, um, and also operating from a premise that all things being equal, children should be with their parents. Um, but obviously there are cases where that can't be the case because of risk issues. Through that work with child protection, um, I then was um, I then began to receive some referrals for family court assessments. Uh, now, there's two roles as a private practitioner. There's two ways, two main ways that I would be involved in family court work. One is where I am treating either one of the parents or treating a child where there's a family court dispute, and I might be asked to provide a report as a treating professional. Using sort of criminal court language, that's a bit like just in that sense, I'm a witness. So I'm a witness to my client, um, how they've been functioning and, and what their needs are and so on. Um, but the, um, the, the next or the second role that I would play with the family court is as what's called a single expert. Uh, and a single expert is somebody, an individual person that the court has appointed or the court has approached to provide an unbiased uh, family assessment um, in the case of the family court. Um, so what that means is I am acting foremost uh, as um, someone who's informing the magistrate around the key issues from an unbiased perspective. So if I'm treating one of the parents, I'm automatically assumed by the court, and fairly so, to be biased because it's in my it's in the interest of my therapeutic relationship with my client to make sure that I I maintain. Um, a positive relationship and a positive regard and also as a treating professional I don't get to see necessarily all of the background information within a family dispute whereas as a single expert um, I would be given access to all the information relevant to the dispute so information from both parents both sides of the argument if you like I would get access to um, any other um, documents that the court would have at their disposal so that might be prior criminal information or family violence information and so on I would then be asked to assess the relevant parties so probably the parent most likely the parents each of the parents looking for any mental health conditions any substance con conditions um, and of course assessing their parenting capacity and looking at the um, attachment. So very similar in some ways to what I would do for child protection, um, but the purpose here is to inform the magistrate around um, what's in the best interest of the children. And that might be making recommendations about over, overnight stays, about what's a fair split of time, around what might be the um, negative impact of overnight stays. So if you think about, um, I think the most obvious example there is a baby who is still being breastfed. What would be the impact on the baby of an overnight stay with dad? We start from the premise again that children deserve a, a relationship with both parents um, and that um, the, those relationships need to be protected and nurtured, uh, but also um, that that doesn't mean we're looking at the rights of the parents when we're doing these individual, uh, these family assessments for the court as a single expert. It means that we're starting from the premise of what the child needs most. So the child needs to have a relationship with their, both their parents, all things being equal, um, 
but the child also needs to have a primary attachment figure and needs to feel safe and secure in their own home and needs to have a sense of stability and predictability and so on. So what we might recommend to the court will vary depending on the age and stages of development and several other factors that might be going on for the individual child and, and, um, and the parents as well. So it can be quite a complex process. Um, sometimes it's quite straightforward but generally speaking it's quite a complex process. So when we're looking at parenting capacity what does that actually mean? Generally speaking the court's interested to know um, are there some factors within each of the parents that limit their ability to identify um, the needs of the child, to um, act on the needs of the child and to promote the well-being of the child. So is the parent, does the parent have any intellectual limitations that would impact their ability to identify what the child needs and provide that? Um, are there any access limitations? So does the, does the parent live in, an, in a rural, isolated situation without a car? And does the child have, and I have had cases like this, where the child has had significant health needs and the parents are unable uh, to um, provide access uh, to healthcare professionals because of their living location and their lack of access to a, a vehicle. Um, and of course, you know, these cases can be very difficult and complex and heartbreaking to work on. Um, so sometimes parenting capacity is also looking at um, the capacity of a parent to have what we call um, reflective parenting capacity. And this is where the parent is um, able to hypothesize what the needs of the child are. So think again, think about a baby that can't tell you what's going on. Uh, and, and their only form of communication is perhaps crying or their main form of communication is crying um, and does the parent have the capacity to hypothesize what's going on for, for the baby and to make some fairly rational um, um, guesses around what the baby needs and then acting appropriately both emotionally and in a practical sense on what that baby needs. So, um, so it, can be a little bit more um, esoteric, if you like, when, we, when we're thinking about reflective parenting capacity. Uh, we're looking at, you know, how does the parent um, understand the world view of their baby? Can, how do they talk? And, and we know that through how, how parents talk about what's going on in their, in their baby's world. Um, I often look for language to, you know, how people talk about their babies tells me a lot. Um, uh, when people are talking about their babies in terms of, oh, the little so-and-so, she's so manipulative, um, or the little so-and-so, she's just got everyone wrapped around her little finger. Um, so when people talk about babies as if babies are some kind of agent of evil <laughs> and, and, and are really just out for all they can get, um, as opposed to, you know, a, a gentle and sensitive and caring understanding of, of a baby's need to feel safe and secure um, as opposed to being, you know, a manipulative um character. Of course if you've seen Boss Baby, uh, the movie Boss Baby, <laughs> uh, you might think of some funny examples of manipulative babies but that's not the real world is it? Alright, so when I am approached um, to act as a single expert, one of the obligations I have is to make sure there's no conflict of interest. So in a small community like, like Hobart, um, I need to rule out that I've not had a treating relationship or any other kind of relationship uh, with the family in question. So if there have been prior clients of mine, then there's a conflict of interest and I can't act in that case. Um, obviously if they're um, a family known to me personally or friends of mine or colleagues of mine then clearly I can't act in that case either. So there are some significant obligations on the single expert to make sure that we keep our noses clean, we remain unbiased, we can offer um, a, you know, a, a fairly clear snapshot of what's going on for that family. And that is how I explain my role to clients when they're referred for these assessments. I explain that obviously we can't know the subtle nuances of day-to-day -day living and the day-to-day -day aspects of the conflict that's gone on with that family. 
So people often come in the door frustrated and cynical. So they don't understand why they've been sent to me. They think it's a waste of time, a waste of money, da da da. And they also think that, well, how could I possibly have anything relevant to say? Because how can I possibly know what's going on behind the scenes? So I talk to families very much around my role is to add my psychological training and insight to a snapshot of what this family looks like and interpret that snapshot from a psychologist's perspective for the family court to understand. I also explain that my report is only one piece of the jigsaw puzzle that the magistrate is putting together. So the magistrate is, um, they've, they've seen so many things over the years of their work in the family court. They, uh, they know what they're doing and they're looking at a psychological element as one piece of the puzzle that they're putting together before they make decisions around what's fair and equitable for each parent and specifically for the children in question. So I am really happy to answer questions about these topics. Um, what I'd like you to do though, because I do have to head off to this meeting, is if you've got some questions about family court work, please post them in the comments section today. And what I will do is I'll answer your questions in the comments section. And if there are any really curly questions, I'll do a separate vlog on those particular questions as well. There's a whole range, a whole series of videos that I could do around the family court, around child protection work, around um, parenting capacity, around reflective parenting and so on. It's a really big meaty subject area and one I really love working in. Um, I am in the process of training, we're about to, about to embark on the process of training um, some of my team members to do this work so that we can offer more um, family assessment work, um, opportunities to more families so that that speeds up the process a little bit if there are more people in the community able to offer those assessments because it can be really hard sometimes for families when there's a long wait before they can access a psychologist to do one of these assessments and it holds the court process up and everybody gets frustrated. Um, but you know, we all do what we can and do the best that we can, of course. So thank you very much for joining me today. And I'm sorry that I do need to rush off, but I thought I would talk about this topic while it, while it struck me. As I said, I'd just come straight out of the office of a, one of my team members here talking about this very topic. And I thought, you know, I think others might be interested in this too. So we will talk about this topic again. I have talked about co-parenting before. So if you scroll through back through some of my very early videos in the vlog series, uh, there are two videos back to back around um, co-parenting after divorce. Uh, if that's an, a topic you'd like me to speak about again, I'm more than happy to do that too. Have a wonderful Monday, whatever you're doing. And I will talk to you all again tomorrow. For Tomorrow will be day 87 of my vlog challenge. So we are very rapidly approaching the 90 day mark. Um, and then I'll be able to let you all in on what my plans are post those 90 days. Have a fantastic day today. I'll talk to you all again tomorrow. Bye bye for now.